One of the great joys of my job here at the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites is being able to share the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment with people. The Emancipation Proclamation in particular is one of the most emotionally powerful documents in American history. It's one that people really connect to, that often you can see their, their response to it almost immediately and the, the power of this is the first document that says that slavery in the United States is going to come to an end. It doesn't end slavery immediately or fully, as, as many people think, but it's that important first step. And it is one that millions of people have been waiting for for years. The Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment are among the most emotionally resonant and historically important documents in U.S. history, really comparable to the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution in the impact we've had on our country. Both date back to the Civil War, which when it started in 1861, was really over the issue of slavery. There were almost four million enslaved people in the South, and the South seceded in large part because they wanted to make sure that the institution of slavery was maintained and that they could expand it as the country expanded West. It became very clear that there was never going to be a unified nation again while slavery existed in half of the country. And Abraham Lincoln, realizing this and, and many others thought about how could he end slavery and he tried offering to pay slave owners to free enslaved people. He tried to make all kinds of arrangements and when he first ha had been inaugurated he even said we won't you know we won't try to abolish slavery we're just trying to to keep the country together but but finally he realized that he just had to end slavery. And the one way that he could do that was through his war powers. So he drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. He did the first draft of it in July of 1862 and presented it to his cabinet. Then he announced in September, after the Battle of Antietam to the South, that if they did not surrender by January 1st of 1863, then all of the slaves in areas that were then under rebellion would be freed. Of course, they did not surrender, and so on January 1st, he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And the document we have here at the museum actually bears his signature. It was the custom at the White House to have a huge reception for dignitaries and the public. And so Lincoln spent several hours at that reception in the morning before he could get free to actually sign the proclamation. When he did, his hand was actually swollen from shaking so many people's hands all morning. But he wanted to be sure that people knew he did not hesitate. He knew at the time he signed this document that it would be one of the most important moments of his presidency. And so he gripped the pen very firmly and made sure that it was a clear signature. That copy of the Emancipation Proclamation is the official one that's in the National Archives. But what we have here is the inkwell he used when he signed that document. His youngest son, Tad, asked as a favor that, that it be given to his tutor. And the tutor's family preserved it, and they actually attached a note to the back that tells the history of the inkwell. We don't know if the tutor's family, if the tutor himself ever used this, but I like to think he didn't, and that the ink inside is the ink that would have been used to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. So what did the Emancipation Proclamation do? It did not free four million enslaved people right away. Perhaps freed 50,000 people, as it, it really was just aimed at the, the areas that were in rebellion, but it did several very important things. First of all, it made it clear that the war was explicitly about slavery and about ending slavery. It allowed African Americans to enlist in the military, which many had been helping out unofficially. They'd been freeing themselves, going behind the lines, helping out with works, but they couldn't officially become soldiers and sailors until the Emancipation Proclamation. And then about 200,000 did enlist and were valiant in their service and really proved that they were equal to anyone else through the, their service in the war. It also probably kept England and France out of the war 
The Confederacy had been hoping that they would get international support and that this would help them win militarily, especially England was very dependent upon southern cotton. But France and England had already outlawed slavery, so they couldn't really come in on the side of the Confederacy once it was clear that the Confederacy was very much about perpetuating slavery. But the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery permanently. If you could think of it maybe like an executive order that the president signs today, and that meant that it could be thrown out in the future. Although it says that henceforth all people freed under the Emancipation Proclamation shall be free if there was a change in administration or if it was overruled by the Supreme Court that could change. So he knew the only way to make it permanent was to have an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And there was certainly a great deal of support in Congress, but that didn't mean it wasn't going to be a tough fight because the country was divided over this. And so the other document we have, the 13th Amendment, in many ways is even more important legally because it is the document that ends slavery. It was proposed in 1864. It made it through the Senate, but it failed in the House of Representatives. And Lincoln was going through a really hard period in 1864. He was up for re-election until fairly far along in the fall. It looked like he might lose. And his opponent was the former General George McClellan, who he had actually fired and who would probably have sued for peace with the South very quickly. And those terms might well have included the perpetuation of slavery. Fortunately, Lincoln won the election, and so after the election, they very quickly went back to work trying to pass it through the House, and they succeeded. On January 31st, 1865, the resolution passed the House of Representatives and then was able to be sent out to the states for ratification. The copy we have of the 13th Amendment was signed by Lincoln and the, many of the senators who voted for it, as well as the Speaker of the House, Schuyler Colfax, who was also from Indiana. And it was probably a, a copy meant to be given to one of the people who had voted on the, the resolution. We don't know exactly who it went to, but you see very clearly Abraham Lincoln's signature. And there are three copies that he signed with the senators and 12 copies with the House. So ours is one of those three Senate copies. Congress objected and said the president really shouldn't be signing this until it was ratified. Of course, Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. It wasn't ratified until December of 1865. So these are the only copies that, that Lincoln signed. One other thing that the 13th Amendment says that is, is perhaps more controversial is that it, it eliminates involuntary servitude except where it is punishment for a crime for which the person has been duly convicted. This was quite the loophole, and the southern states that were trying to reinstate the conditions of slavery caught it right away. And so they realized that if they could make up a whole range of crimes for which they could arrest blacks, then they could essentially put them back in near slavery conditions. We still see remnants of that in our prison system today, and there's still a lot of discussion. When you hear people talk about mass incarceration having its roots in slavery and in the aftermath of the Civil War, they're really looking at the results of that phrase in the 13th Amendment as being at the core of a lot of the abuses that, that came into the system. A lot of people who, who voted for the 13th Amendment the end of slavery meant that, of course, African Americans were citizens. Of course, they should have equal rights. But for others, they said, no, no, what we voted on was literally the end of slavery, period. And this was a very important thing to figure out. And that's why you have the 14th Amendment, which says, if you're born in the United States, you automatically are a citizen. The Congress passed quite a few laws to really uh, uphold these amendments. But as Southern governments of people who had been involved with the Confederacy were able to get back in power, they very quickly worked to restrict all those rights. And, and so then you get Jim Crow, you get segregation, you get discrimination, you get incredible violence against people trying to defend those rights. 
And that really leads to the civil rights movement in the 1960s and to difficulties, issues that we're still grappling with today. We really have not gotten through the legacy of slavery and the, the Civil War even now. We're still working on it. And it's interesting if you think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. 1963, the year of the March on Washington, was also the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And Dr. King had actually gone to President Kennedy and suggested a second Emancipation Proclamation to address segregation. That did not happen, and he really turned his attention to the March on Washington. But if you listen to the beginning of his I Have a Dream speech, it starts by talking about the Emancipation Proclamation and the tremendous promise in that document and says, you know, we haven't achieved it yet. The discrimination we face, you know, we need to, we need to renew this. We need to get back to these documents. It's very powerful how the Emancipation Proclamation really continued and continues today to be an emotional spur, to be a real shining star for people looking at how we can move toward a more just society. So how did we come to have these, these documents, the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, here at the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites? In 1905, a life insurance company in Fort Wayne asked Robert Lincoln, who's President Abraham Lincoln's only surviving son, if they could use Lincoln's name for their company. And he not only agreed, but sent them a picture that then became the basis of their logo. Their founder was so devoted to Lincoln that in 1928, he actually started a research library and that eventually became a museum and devoted to scholarship about Lincoln and to preserving this history. And it was through that, the development of that museum that what is now Lincoln Financial Group who acquired the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. Ultimately, they decided that they should not be in the business of running a museum, and we were very fortunate that they entrusted what is now the Lincoln Financial Foundation collection to the state of Indiana on behalf of its people. We also have a website where you can access all of the objects and, and documents in the collection online at lincolncollection.org, and it's a great place to really delve into the riches of this collection.